Hi, welcome to Curator's Corner, Frank Figli Uzi, the FBI's Keeper of the Code. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, DC. Thank you for joining us today. Spy Museum historian and curator, Dr. Andrew Hammond, uh, will begin his conversation with Frank Figliozzi in just a few moments. But just a few words about Frank first. He was appointed the FBI's chief inspector by then director Robert Mueller. As keeper of the code, Frank was charged with overseeing sensitive internal inquiries, target shooting reviews, and performance audits. His new book, the FBI way that you can see gloriously here on the screen, Inside the Bureau's Code of Excellence draws on his career, serving as a special agent for 25 years with leadership positions in major American cities. And I'm sure like me, you have seen Frank commenting on all the incredible goings on of the last a uh, few weeks. He is a national security analyst uh, for uh, ABC. After Frank and Andrew's conversation, we'll turn to your questions. To ask questions, please use the Q&A feature to write them in. We'll be sorting through them. We'll do our best to get to them, but we've already had people sending them in via email. So I already know we're not gonna get to all of the questions. Now, before I turn this over to Andrew and Frank, I do have to thank our um, really terrific sponsor, AT&T Public, Public Sector. AT&T makes programs like this and others free so we can all be here and enjoy them together. So I can't thank you enough, AT&T Public Sector. All right, enough from me, over to you two. I'll be back with the questions later. Well, I'm thrilled to be speaking to you today, Frank, um, and I've read your excellent book. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to getting going and to, to asking some, some interesting questions. I think, you know, I would like to hear a bit more about the book, about where it came from and what you set out to do. But I think to start with, there's a, there's a beautiful vignette at the beginning of the book where you outline how you ended up joining the FBI. And I believe it involves writing a letter, right? This is true. Andrew, thanks for, for having me and for, for moderating it. This allows uh, all of us, I hope, to take a breath from the events of the last couple of weeks and perhaps the last four years and to uh, and just have a nice discussion about things we're passionate for. Um, speaking of things we're passionate for, yes, my, my passion for the FBI started as a young boy I grew up in Southern Connecticut. It was the New York media market, which meant that, you know, whenever I caught the news or read a paper, I saw the FBI was taking down mob families and organized crime figures, and they were doing it with their brains. And I thought that this is really fascinating. And of course, as a kid, I got a steady dose of TV shows that featured the FBI solving all kinds of mysteries within an hour and years. And Indeed, um, that's the course my, my education and my life took. And so, so tell us a little bit more about this uh, code that you refer to in the book. So as the keeper of the code, what, what is the code? Can you explain that for us, please? Certainly. Let, let's, let's talk about the overarching uh, theme of the book, which is this. The FBI operates at an incredibly high level of excellence when it matters the most, when the stress is the highest. For example, right now, across our nation, the stakes are the highest. And they do so even when everyone is having questions about the FBI. So I wrote this book to say, look, I spent 25 years and dedicated my life to this, this organization that I love. I absorbed how they do values-based leadership. That is protecting what matters most internally, at the FBI so they can protect what matters most externally to our nation and our democracy. And you don't need to spend 25 years inside the FBI to glean some of the leadership lessons about protecting core values and even as a nation getting through the time that we're in. 
So it starts with the code. I distilled all of my 25 years, including leadership roles inside the Bureau's Office of Professional Responsibility, including roles as inspector and chief inspector. I distilled it down to what I call the seven C's. The first of the seven C's is called code. And that's really the first chapter in the book because everything flows from your core values. Your code of conduct comes from what you identify as most important to your team, company, and country. If you don't go through that exercise of identifying what it is that might pose an existential threat to your family, your company, your country, then you can't go forward to the other seven Cs. So you start with what is it that makes us tick? What is it we must protect at all costs? What is it our people can never do lest they completely undermine the operation of what we stand for. So that's code, the code of conduct. In the FBI, um, it's a rigorous um, set of operating rules for personal and professional conduct that everybody follows because everybody collectively is part of the protection of the core values of the Bureau. And, and tell us a little bit more about, you know, the code, like if so, you mentioned in the book that it's easier to to, to convert people who are already in, in the, the church, so to speak, but it's harder to convert agnostics. What would you say to those people that think that, you know, those old fashioned notions of a code and stuff, that's, that's fell by the wayside. That's, it's, you know, I mean, it's quaint and it's great, but, you know, I'm not sure if I believe it anymore. How would you, how would you sort of respond to someone that had that, um, that sort of viewpoint? Well, first, the, the book lays out the assertion that a, the most effective and successful leadership is the kind of leadership that at its core is about values. So you might even say, I'm, I'm, I'm an agnostic on whether all of this rigorous code stuff and, and everyone believing in a certain code of conduct is, is really worth it. I say this, um, try doing it without and see what happens. The, the, the proof is in the pudding. And I say, you need only look as recently as January 6th at what happened at the United States Capitol building to note that there's a large portion of our society that's playing by a different code that isn't on the same sheet of music and that will need to be convinced to come back to the code and core values of the United States. That's an extreme example of what can happen on a national level without a standard code of conduct and core values that are collectively adapted as, as your own. But it, it also, I've seen it happen in agencies and I've seen it happen in Fortune 100 companies. And could you sketch out some of the rest of the C's for us, please? So you mentioned, you know, code, but there are seven C's that you outline in the book, right? Sure, of course. So the, the next chapter is conservancy. And so code starts at, at day one at the FBI Academy. It really starts with recruitment and getting people in the door that have their own standards and moral foundation and that can easily adapt to the, the, the concept that they're responsible for something greater than themselves. That starts at the Academy. And the second chapter talks about conservancy, the notion that Protecting core values is a team sport. So many times I walk into a company to consult, for example, and if you ask somebody in the hallway, who's responsible here for standards, integrity, uh, a compliance, they'll point down the hall and say, there's an office down there called compliance or standards. They take care of that. And then, you know, we have a corporate audit staff and, and they, they make sure that's being enforced. The FBI has all of that, but more importantly, it's the notion that every single employee is accountable for the greater organization, its reputation, its brand, and they're accountable for each other's conduct as well as their own. And that's ingrained throughout your journey in the FBI from day one, right through your management training leadership with mandatory assignments, for example, on inspections, on audits, with, with mandatory um, assignment of internal investigations where you have to make hard calls against fellow employees. That concept of conservancy is, is really ingrained throughout the Bureau and throughout your career. And, and, and for conservancy, like how, 
How do you see that notion apply to the national level over the past, say, the past four years or the past couple of decades? Like, what, what's going on there? So, so my theory on this is, as I said, the, the, uh, the employee who points down the hall and says someone else handles uh, ethics, standards, and compliance, I think as a nation, many Americans have actually said, there's, it's someone else's responsibility, like our elected officials, maybe even Congress members. It's even the guy in the Oval Office who will take care of our values. And what's that's, what that's morphed into is other people telling us what America's values should be, not necessarily what they truthfully are, the rule of law, the Constitution, three equal branches of government. So conservancy starts with educating your populace. And, and if you're a school teacher, it starts with teaching kids what America really is all about, what the Constitution and the rule of law, three equal branches of government really means so that you don't have a segment of the population going south on you and thinking that they're not conservators of the values or thinking wrongly that they're somehow conservators of some other notion of America. And, and one of the things that I find fascinating is if you, if you mention those three letters to someone, F, B, I, a whole variety of things come to mind, but one of them is of the, um, you know, the, the, the G man who's um, following the code and who's trying to, you know, follow the, the values outlaid in the constitution and so forth. Like, why is the FBI, why does it have that, that mythos or that, that reputation as being a repository of, of some of the values of the United States? Well, first, of, some of it is actually executive order authorities and legislative authorities because they do literally get up every day. And the, the book is dedicated to the men and women rank and file employees of the FBI who actually get up and actually know that they're take, they've taken an oath to protect and preserve the Constitution of the United States and, and the people therein. And so they are code keepers, in a sense, for the nation. They, they investigate over 300 violations of law. They're, they're a hybrid intelligence and law enforcement agency. So for a living, they actually enforce code literally. But I think that the mystique and mythos behind the FBI is also part of a reflection of how critically important it is for the FBI to maintain public trust and credibility. One of the seven C's in the book, Andrew, is in fact a chapter on credibility. And it, credibility says it's not required to be perfect, to be credible. The FBI is not perfect. If people think that I've written a book claiming the FBI is perfect, this isn't that book. But credibility is about being passionate, about getting it right. And so when the FBI screws up, it's on the front page of every single paper, but Credibility is how you handle that mistake transparently, owning up to it, holding yourself accountable, and telling us what you're going to do to fix it. And I give examples of that in, in the book. And, and one, of the, one of the other things that I find really fascinating is, you know, in the book, you, you, know, you outline, you know, this, this kid from a small town in Connecticut you know, the first in your family to, to graduate from college. What, on a human level, what's it like to find yourself with all of this responsibility as the keeper of the code, as the head of counterintelligence for such a treasured national institution like the FBI? Like, what, I guess, what is it like to be you? What is it like to reach that high position within, a, within an institution like the FBI? So for me, it, it's an, it was an incredibly humbling experience. I, I, one of the reasons I chose the FBI, besides all of the mystique and all of the awesome responsibilities it held, was because my other alternative coming out of law school was to be a prosecutor. And I pursued that and I got job offers. But what attracted me was that awesome responsibility. The, the FBI said to me, we're going to give you, on day one after the academy, you're going to get a stack of cases, the gun and the badge, and you're gonna be responsible for solving those cases. Lots of prosecutors offices told me, hey, we love you, but you're gonna spend a year before you get in front of a felony jury trial. You're gonna be writing motions and briefs in a law library, blah, blah, blah. And so the responsibility started immediately. And at the academy, when you're, when you're issued your weapon and you realize that it's not just a responsibility 
for the nation's security, it's, it's being entrusted with the possibility that you might take a life. They tell you in your academy experience that a couple of you in this classroom right now will fire your weapon at an adversary within the first year of your duty. That's an awesome understanding. It's a humbling understanding. And you have to constantly remind yourself that you work for the United States citizen and the taxpayer pays your salary. And there is, I would, I would be remiss in saying that there isn't stress and burnout attached. A lot of people don't know that there's mandatory retirement for FBI agents at age 57, and you are permitted to retire at any age with 25 years of service. It is a grinder of a, of a responsibility and a job. And what I tell young people, Andrew, who come to me all the time with questions, I advise them that remember something, this is not a job. This is a vocation and a calling and it's part of that conservancy and it will demand a sacrifice. And I write about in the book, the sacrifices that I've seen in my own life, but nothing matches the ultimate sacrifice of a conservator, which is the agents who've been killed in the line of duty. And I tell the stories of some that were personal friends of mine. Would you like to, uh, for the listeners, would you like to discuss one of those stories for us? Well, I think let's start with the general concept of, of, of stewards and conservators and, and the fact that it demands a sacrifice. And a sacrifice could mean anything from losing weekends, holidays, and kids' ball games. We've all experienced that in the FBI, but sometimes it means losing your life as a service martyr and your name being up on a wall of those killed in the line of duty. And I talk about what it's like to walk into a field office. And I was assigned to field offices like Miami, like Cleveland, that are literally named after an agent from that office that was killed in the line of duty. And what it's like to walk in every day and see that name ingrained in the building, meaning this agent died for us in this jurisdiction. Um, so I talked specifically about a couple of folks. One, an agent in my new agent's class back in 1987, a guy named Barry Bush, who years later was killed in a shootout with some violent bank robbers. I also talk about a female agent named Lori Fournier, who worked for us in the Cleveland division where I was in charge. She was an awesome person, the kind of person you'd want as a neighbor or friend. She was joyful. Um, she danced on bubble wrap in the office. She played in an office rock band called Fed Up, and she was the singer. Um, she was part of the employee assistance program in the office, meaning she would come alongside and coordinate counseling and assistance for family members of FBI employees who needed assistance. And she was also part of the evidence response team, meaning those crime scene folks that you see on television. Um, she responded, in fact, to the 9-11 crash site in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, um, and was at that dig for quite some time collecting evidence. She developed cancer, very advanced cancer, and very quickly, even though she worked to the last day, um, she passed away, leaving two young children and a husband. And I talk about her in the chapter called Compassion, another one of the seven C's, because there's also a cold bureaucratic side of the FBI. And sometimes when an agent passes away, um, throwing the family a few pamphlets about death benefits doesn't cut it for me. And I talk about cutting through the bureaucracy and, and, and showing compassion and literally changing the policy in the FBI so that they would fly into the town and a benefits expert would personally sit down with the family and explain the benefits, very complicated, in person. It's an example of a bureaucracy showing compassion when they're pushed to do so. And then I, I end the Lori Fournier story with this interesting part of compassion. The FBI approached the family after Lori's death and said, would you like to have her, her medical records assessed and even her medical sampling assessed because we think her cancer might have derived from her work at the site of the 9-11 crash in Shanksville? And the family said, yes. And the FBI concluded the cancer was work-related and Lori's name is now up on that wall as someone who was killed as a direct uh, in, in performance of her duties. It's that kind of compassion showing the family, we're going to take accountability for this. 
we're going to help get to the bottom of this. And uh, another um, question that struck me on reading your book, Frank, was are FBI agents uh, created or are they made? So does it attract the type of people that will upkeep the code or does it make them the types of people that upkeep the code or is it a little bit of both? It's going to be both. This is the old uh, nature versus nurture uh, question, Andrew. And I think I have to say the kinds of people attracted to the FBI are the kinds of people attracted to the notion that there, there is a fight for justice going on, that there are forces in the world that run counter to goodness. And, and those people tend to be people who want to stand for something and understand that if you don't stand for something, you could fall for anything. Even a country could fall for just about anything. And maybe some of us already have. So I, I combine who you're recruiting with how you're instilling in them the code, the code um, of conduct and core values. And then really important message of the book, do you have the mechanisms and structure in place to do this right so that you're literally preserving those core values through your people throughout the history of your organization? That's the key. That's really what the seven C's are about. That's that rigor and structure around getting it right. And, and another part that really struck me as, as being really interesting was you speak about when you were um, in your position as an inspector, you, you said that you learned more about things like uh, counterintelligence, uh, counterterrorism, white collar crime, than you were actually doing them on an operational basis. Could you just, for anybody that's not you know familiar with the FBI, could you just sketch that out for us, please? Yeah, absolutely. So I talked about how, as a conservancy, the FBI starts ingraining in you that you're a, you're a steward of, of the code. Everybody is, and particularly true as you go up the ladder in leadership. So how do they do that? Mandatory assignments to things like the audit team. It's called the inspection division. For those of us uh, joining today that are part of cor large corporations, you'll know it as the, the audit staff. But um, it's the notion that if you want to go up in the, in the, in the organization, you gotta, you got to do your time learning the best practices and the worst practices of the organization. And I always encourage people, um, you can actually choose to do this full time for a while in the FBI. And people generally run away from that notion. They, they're like, wait, wait a minute, I, I didn't sign up to look at other pro people's programs and cases. Um, and I say this, it makes you a heck of a better leader when you learn what people are doing right what people are doing wrong, and how to assess the meaningful metrics around that. It shouldn't be someone else's job. Don't leave it to someone else. If you have a chance in your agency, your company, to raise your hand for that kind of assignment, I say do it because it makes you a much better leader, a much better keeper of the code. And, and just to give us an insight into the FBI culture. So for many of us who watch uh, movies like Serpico or TV shows like The Wire, you know, we've got this notion that inspectors or audit or internal affairs people, they're the people who have their names like scrolled on the toilet wall. Is that, is that the same kind of thing in the FBI or is it something different? Well, there are times in your career when you're in there that you, no one wants to sit next to you in the cafeteria, if, that, if that's what you mean. Uh, but I, I think, you know, one of, the, one of the keys here is there's an understanding in the Bureau that this is an agency that holds everybody accountable. And so there, it's understood that it's not you sitting across the table asking hard questions about an allegation internally. It's really the Bureau and everyone in it and quite frankly, the American taxpayer that demands the highest standards, including Congress and DOJ and the White House, it, it, people tend to understand that this, there's a bigger picture here. Um, but for, for those who don't, by the way, they don't, they don't last very long in the FBI. They don't, if they don't get that collective sense of core values and why you're asking, um, you know, they, they, they need to move along because it's, it's what they signed up for. And I, I tell people this, and it's, I say this in the book, the FBI spends more time vetting and, ba and background investigating the person who serves coffee in the coffee shop at FBI headquarters than we do vetting a presidential candidate. 
And that tells you volumes about who gets into the FBI. And it tells you some disturbing things about who might even become a senator or a president. That, that was actually one of my questions. So I wondered if we could just come back to that. Um, I know that you have some uh, views and insight about, about the political process and about political candidates and, and some real life experience there. So just uh, for the listeners, could you just pick out a couple of stories to help illustrate this larger point? Yeah, this is one of the, the approaches in the book that I call a teachable moment. And by that, I mean, I get stopped even in, at the supermarket if I'm recognized with a mask on these days. And I get, I get asked things like, how, how in the world did somebody like Donald Trump ever get a top secret clearance? Or how in the world did this particular senator or member of Congress ever get cleared for the information they receive. And, and I have to take time out and explain to them, no one, no one does a background on elected officials. That's not how our democracy works. You voted for him, you've got him, and it's given automatically because the role requires it. But I give that story about the guy pouring coffee at, at FBI headquarters who has the top secret, and we've gone over his finances and his income and his debt, and uh, we've, we've knocked on his neighbor's doors, right? None of that happens. And so people say, well, wait a minute, Frank, what are you proposing? Are you proposing that some guys in suits and some bureaucratic agency should decide who becomes president? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is we failed um, as a nation to vet properly some of these folks, and we've got to change the way we do it as a nation. One of those steps would be mandatory tax return disclosure, mandatory financial disclosure and analysis disclosure of foreign entanglements, family, businesses, and otherwise. We can't afford to have a national security threat sitting in the Oval Office. And I, I believe that at one point in your career, you had a, an interesting experience with a presidential candidate. I give two examples of the, um, the level of threat we're facing and the fact that no one does backgrounds on elected officials. The first one is when people say, well, this is unique. This, is, this, this last four years has been about questions around whether the president was a threat. No one would ever think this goes on anywhere else. I say in the book, au contraire, um, while I was assistant director, I had to personally confront a sitting member of Congress and tell that member that a we knew that a foreign intelligence service considered that member to be an informant an asset of their foreign intelligence service. That goes on more than you think. I also separately had to sit down with a minor candidate for president um, few, several years ago and let that person know that we understood that they were clandestinely engaged with foreign intelligence officers and they needed to stop that immediately. That's what I was left to do. Please stop, right? It's not that we have some mechanism to yank you. We, it's not that we have a mechanism to investigate you before you get elected. That's where we are. That's the level of threat. And, and one thing that um, I also really wanted to ask you was, as the former head of counterintelligence for the FBI, you know, and for myself as someone that lives in Washington, Washington's often said to be the, the global epicenter of espionage. Um, how much of a headache is that for, for the head of counterintelligence for the FBI? That, that's a lot of responsibility and a lot going on. Could you sketch that picture out for us? Well, you want to you talk about what we refer to in the business as a target-rich environment. Uh, you can draw that circle around the beltway and, and you'd be looking at one of the largest target rich environments. What do I mean by that? I mean, the bad guys, many of whom post real life intelligence officers through their diplomatic establishments, all the embassies in Washington, you know, and these, these intelligence officers, as your viewers know, they, they actually use cover positions, you know, the, their business card at the embassy might say, first attache or, or something like that. But in reality, they're a card carrying intelligence officer and they're spying. Um, but I also, so, so 
you know, one of the largest counterintelligence programs in the field office in the FBI is no, no kidding, the Washington field office. But I have to say this, particularly in the, in the years since um, the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, it's not all about the military and political secrets anymore. So yes, it's active in DC, but I'm here to tell you that if you go out to Silicon Valley, California and the high tech industry, you go to New York and the finance industry, if you go out to middle America and look at agricultural research and, and PhD level research at research universities, that's where the new action is. That's where it's harder to catch the spies. It's one thing to follow people out of an embassy. It's another thing to figure out why that guy is digging into the ground, picking out a hybrid seed being researched in Kansas, or why someone's embedded themselves inside a Silicon Valley high tech firm and keeps asking questions about the Pentium chip secret, which by the way, during my time supervising um, counter Intel in Silicon Valley was stolen. The secret to the Pentium Intel chip was stolen by an employee. So um, that's, the, that's the new threat. Economic espionage is, is where it's at. And over the course of your 25 year career in FBI, could you, could you give us a sense of some of the shifts that you saw take place? So you mentioned economic espionage and I know that when 9-11 happened, you ended up doing some interesting work in South Florida. And at that point, counterterrorism became really important. Give us a sense of some of those uh, shifts that you have saw in the course of your career. The, I, I cover most of this in the last, the last chapter in the book, the last of the seven C's is called consistency. And I, I'm careful to say that consistency, this rigorous adherence to a set of protocols and values should not be mistaken for rigidity in the failure to pivot when you need to pivot. So here's what I mean by that. After 9-11, the FBI woke up and said, all right, we're an investigative agency that's really the best in the world at telling you what happened after it happened. And that's really great, but we better pivot to become an intelligence agency capable of predicting and preventing the next act of terrorism. So people would say, well, well, Frank, that's, that's not consistency. That's the FBI shifting away from its mission. And I say, oh no, no, it's actually an extreme example of consistency, consistency of mission because the FBI asked itself, what are we? And at its core, the FBI is a national security agency. They protect the security of the American people. So you have to ask yourself, do circumstances now dictate that we shift the way we implement who we are? Not what we are, but rather how we do what we are. And so the FBI did a dramatic strategic shift throughout the Bureau after 9-11, where intelligence analysts were hired in droves because intelligence had to drive case openings, informant development, and decision making like never before. So that's an example of consistency of mission, but pivoting away to face the threat. The, the, the other example of that is, um, I, you know, I, I talked about the need to change and reconsider FBI priorities right now. The number one priority in the FBI right now is counterterrorism. It may be politically incorrect to suggest that it should be otherwise. Why is that? Because it's been 20 years since 9-11 when we first listed that priority. But we haven't had a major terrorism attack. But if you were to suggest that, say, for example, the counterintelligence threat, where we almost lost our election system, where we've almost lost our democracy because of foreign propaganda, foreign intelligence service hacking, theft of trade secrets by intelligence services, ha um, um, hacking and denial of service by state sponsors, this is counterintelligence. And during my time in the FBI, I suggested during an annual review of priorities that maybe it was time to make counterintelligence the number one threat. Everyone agreed it was, it was coming at us like a freight train, but there was political incorrectness in suggesting that the 3,000 people who died in 9-11 somehow would be denigrated if we changed the FBI's priorities to something other than counterterrorism. And I think... Um... On the, on the topic of, of, of staying with counterintelligence, um, just, just to kind of come back to that, um, 
you know, you're one of the few people in the world who will ever become or who has been the head of counterintelligence for the FBI. What, what, what's it like to be, to have that role, to be in that position? Like, are you constantly, um, every time you go to the supermarket or come home, are you looking over your shoulder? How do you sleep with all of the responsibility you have? What's, is, is it just, you know, you start off as a field agent, you get responsibility and you gradually get more and more and, and you just kind of roll with it or, or is it only certain types of people that can really do that type of job? Give us a, give us a sense of what it was like to be you when you had that role. Well, I don't, I don't, first, I don't think I had any particularly unique experience than past heads of counterintelligence. I will share this with you. When I took the job, the senior, the most senior leadership in the FBI told me, we, at this level of, of, of the FBI, we would expect no more than two years before you're burned out. That's the average lifespan of an FBI assistant director in an operational division. That tells you a little bit about what daily life is like. You mentioned sleep, and I talk about sleep in the book and how very little of it you get. Um, and so, look, the there's a couple of things that, that dawn on you, even as, a, even as an agent in the field and a, and a supervisor in the field. I talk about being the on-scene commander of the anthrax murder scene in Boca Raton, Florida, the largest hazardous materials crime scene in the history of the FBI. And we'd never done it before, uh, gone into an, a, a three-story, 60,000 square foot building filled with microscopic anthrax spores that had killed someone never had an anthrax murder in the history of the United States. And as I'm driving every morning, ironically, the, the, um, the building, AMI headquarters, where this happened, was only a few minutes from my home. And as I'm driving from my house to the, to the crime scene, every single day, over the course of a two-week hazardous materials uh, entry in full hazmat gear, the, the teams we sent in there, I'm driving to work in Boca, and I'm looking at kids getting on school buses, people going for their morning jog, people on vacation in Florida, and they have absolutely no idea of the deadly threat um, that's going on down the street. And that happens throughout FBI field offices. You don't want to know as a citizen what's going on just beneath the surface. I, I, I talk about my time in the book supervising crimes against children in Northern California in the San Francisco division. I was a young, a uh, parent of young kids at the time, I would go bring my kids to the playground and it began. I began looking around and I could see the pedophile in the picture. I, I knew that guy over in the corner looking at the kids with no kids of his own, with that high mileage beater of a car in the parking lot that he spent days driving around looking for victims with. I, I knew who the pedophiles were. That's all beneath the surface. And there, there is, in the spy game, the same thing is going on. That guy in the cubicle in the corner at work who's asking too many questions about the research he has no reason to ask about, um, all of this going on just beneath the surface. And here's what's disturbed me the most about the last four years. If you had ever told me I'd be on national television regularly explaining the counterintelligence threat to people, I would have said, what in God's name has happened to the country that that kind of explanation is necessary? Because it's precisely why we have an FBI to take that burden off of you as a citizen, not burden you with it so you can go about your daily life. But the kind of anxiety that Americans have experienced over the last four years, in part, is because they've suddenly become awakened to what every FBI agent knows, that the threat is real, that people get up out of bed every day trying to hurt us, and, and that, that there's a battle going on, and the FBI is essentially at war. And just a couple of final questions, and I'll turn it over to our viewers and listeners for um, some Q&A, um, you know, just to follow up on that point, when you peel back the, the curtain and see what's going on beneath the surface, whether in terms of, um, you know, pedophilia or, or espionage and counter espionage and so forth, how do you, I don't know, how, how do you maintain the constitution to kind of deal with that, like, you know, losing faith in human nature or just seeing a lot of the ugliness that a lot of people are shielded from, like you say, the FBI exists to take that burden off of, you know, the average citizen, but what's it like to have that burden? 
Well, I want to end on a on a on a positive note here because um, the FBI does have heroes. I call them imperfect heroes who who do come to work every day, um, trying to take on that burden and carry it um, for all of us. But the last chapter of the book deliberately is that chapter we talked about called consistency. And here's why I put it at the end of the book because it gives us hope. And by that, I mean, through my FBI career, I've learned that if you're consistent with your core values, you can get through the highest stress times in the history of your life, your organization, and now even our country. What do I mean by that? It's human nature to want to run away from and abandon everything that got you this far, all your values, because you are faced with an unprecedented threat. We could have done that in the anthrax set uh, crime scene. We could have said, we've never had an anthrax murder before. We've never had to go into a, an anthrax uh, hazmat environment before. We don't know how to do this. We, there's got to be some way to do this beyond the training we've had. And I'm saying what we did was we said, we asked ourselves some questions. Are, are we really good at crime scenes? Yes. Have we had training to operate in a hazmat environment? Well, yes, we have. So this is a hazmat crime scene. That's how we're going to look at this. I end the book by saying the nation is under a stress test right now, facing unprecedented threats, domestic and external. And if we cling to our values, not abandon them, but cling to what got us here as a democracy, constitution, rule of law, three equal branches of government, that will get us through this period of time. And I believe we're going to do that. And just one final question from me, and I'll turn it over to Amanda. Uh, it's ending on a lighter note from me as well. I spoke to a couple of friends and told them that I was speaking to you. <laughs> and I said, what, you know, what questions would you like to ask, uh, you know, Frank? And both of them said the same thing. Have you seen the Americans? And what do you think of it? <laughs> because I know a lot of that show, uh, Agent Gad and Agent Adderhall surrounds, uh, you know, counter, the counterintelligence mission of the FBI. Right. So we, we, I get this question a lot about generally uh, FBI related TV shows. And, I, and I, my first answer is I generally don't watch them because I'm the guy screaming at, at the TV screen saying that's wrong. That's inaccurate. They didn't do their homework. And my wife says, that's enough of this. Let's turn the channel. Right. But I, I have watched um, the Americans and I'm, and this is on the topic we just talked about how just beneath the surface of, of your neighborhood, of your nation, there's stuff going on that is that you think is fictional in movies and TV series, but it's not. You know that case, the, the American series is based on a real life case called Ghost Stories, where the 10 Russian uh, sleeper cell agents were sent into the United States. So it happens. The show is very dramatic and there's lots of death and blood, but the concept and the depiction is absolutely on the money. Another great show that is accurate is a show called Mind Hunters. I think it's on Netflix. I hope I got that right. And it's the story of the early history of the FBI's behavioral analysis unit. That is right on the money because it's produced by John Douglas, uh, one of the most famous FBI profilers. Uh, thanks so much, Frank. And I look forward to seeing what our viewers and listeners have for you. Oh, they have so very much and they're coming in all different ways. So even beyond uh, the ones that came in through the chat. So my apologies because we're gonna, gonna slice off the top. I'm gonna try to roll some together. Um, people wonder about um, our immediate past president, Trump. Did his remarks um, about the FBI, have they damaged the FBI's reputation? And also, when do you think it's likely that the Biden uh, team will approve him for top secret uh, information access? But let me make sure I've got the last part correct. Approve who for top secret access? Um, former President Trump for top secret briefings. Do they approve that? Yeah, no, I, so, so I would, so, so typically their ex-presidents do maintain a clearance for the purpose of consulting with them about decisions they made and for briefing them um, moving forward to, to get their buy-in and, and perspective and perhaps even use them as an emissary at times during special circumstances. Um, I would, I, my assertion, and I have written about this for MSNBC uh, Daily, it's their digital news platform where I have a regular column. I have a column coming out today on domestic terrorism. I would assert that President 
uh, Trump and have asserted is a national security threat. He doesn't stop being a national security threat when he leaves office. In fact, I would assert he's a greater national security threat because there's no guardrails and, and he's, he's got lots of information. He's deeply, deeply in debt personally and could be selling, could try to sell and capitalize on his, his knowledge. A president of the United States knows things, even though he doesn't get his briefings. He doesn't read his briefings. He knows what launch time and response is on the nuclear world. He knows what the plan is to defend China if they move on Taiwan. He, he knows where the bugs are in foreign leaders' offices because he hears about what's been intercepted. He's a danger and should not get a continuing national security clearance. And I believe Biden hopefully will move to stop that from happening because uh, ultimately it will be uh, Biden's call, I, I believe. Um, what was the first part of the question? Um, do you think that um, former President Trump uh, damaged the FBI reputation with his comments about? Yeah, look, this is part of why I wrote the book. Um, I could not take the bureau bashing anymore for four years and the damage it was doing to the career professionals at one of the critical institutions in our nation. We've already talked with Andrew about how it, the bureau lives and dies by its public brand and, and perceptions. But I want to say something here because I addressed this in the book as well. This wasn't all about Trump. Um, Trump got handed some excuses to bash the bureau and he got handed an excuse to fire Director Comey by some of the conduct and judgment of some of the most senior people in the FBI, including, including Jim Comey, who is a man of the utmost integrity, ethics, and a career professional. But in my opinion, as I detail in the book, he exhibited poor judgment and a lack of credibility, a lack of accountability, and didn't foresee the damage it would do to his institution when he famously announced with flags draped behind him, quote, no reasonable prosecutor would ever prosecute Hillary Clinton. There's a couple of problems with that. One, it's not the FBI director's call on who to prosecute. That's done across the street at the Department of Justice. Two, he forgot he was accountable to his boss, the Attorney General of the United States, who should have made that call. Number three, he never foresaw that he, in that moment, politicized the FBI in the eyes of about half the country. And then he flipped the other half around when he said, hey, I've got to reopen the case on Hillary because we might have new emails in Anthony Weiner's laptop. And then on the eve of the election, as you all know, he said, never mind, we didn't find any new emails. So he politicized the FBI. He should never have done that in the first place. He handed Trump the reason to bash the bureau. Um, people like Pete Strzok, similarly, um, their conduct as a senior executive was something that merited termination. I talked about that on the air, took a, took a hit for that, by the way, for many of my Twitter followers. Um, but I knew, I knew how to preserve the code and I knew he, he needed to go. Uh, lots of questions that are swirling around um, and about January 6th, um, about the current state of the Bureau addressing domestic terrorism, wondering if January 6th is our new 9-11, was it uh, an intelligence failure, lots of things to chew on there, Frank. Indeed, and um, as I said, I've got a column coming out today on, on the challenge and dilemma of, of countering domestic terrorism, but I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by the fact that it's quite likely that this, ex this violent extremism and its related ideology is not gonna vanish. Um, the president's not going away. The president is likely launching a digital media platform and or a third party, if his claims are accurate, they may not be, but that means he could be leading essentially an echo chamber of extremism and violence um, and where they only hear amplification of their own thoughts. And so the Bureau, as I point out in, in a couple of columns I've already done, um, they, don't, they don't have a domestic terrorism law. I, a lot of people, if you stop them on the street and ask them, hey, do you think it's illegal to be a domestic terrorist? They would say, yeah, of course, of course there is. Got to be a law against that, right? And, and there is not. There is not. We have a law in the, against international terrorism. You'll go away forever, maybe even get executed if you're found to be engaged in international terrorism um, uh, from on U.S. soil or off of U.S. soil against U.S. interests. And a whole set of investigative techniques come with that designation. But domestic terrorism is the only category of criminal conduct in the FBI that you can be investigated for, but never arrested for. 
because there's no law against it. So you, you'll, you'll note with interest that the people inside that Capitol building during the insurrection, what are they getting arrested for? Trespass, theft of Nancy Pelosi's podium, theft of mail, in horrible cases, assault on a federal officer, even the death of one federal officer, Capitol Police officer. But look, when you rob a bank, we don't arrest you for trespass in the bank. We call it what it is. You get arrested for bank robbery. It's time we had a domestic terrorism law that would allow the FBI to go aggressive and assertive and proactive and would, and would get consequences and sentences that reflect the damage that you're doing. That, that, what happened at the Capitol isn't trespass or theft. It's an insurrection. It's domestic terrorism. Let's get a law in the books that calls it what it is. Um, people want to know, switching gears totally, and we'll just break it up and we'll leap around. What was it like uh, working with Robert Hansen, the notorious uh, spy within the FBI? I tell the, I tell the story in the book of the, the day that I was uh, driving to work on a Florida turnpike to FBI Miami. I was the assistant special agent in charge of that field office and on the, on the radio, I heard in the news that the FBI had arrested one of its own, Robert Philip Hansen, for espionage on behalf of the Russians. And I had to pull the car over because I thought I had been punched in the stomach because it wasn't just a betrayal um, by an FBI official. It was a betrayal by a guy who was my boss years before as my unit chief. Uh, when I was a young entry-level supervisor at FBI headquarters. Uh, he had spied for the Russians for 10 years. He was the most damaging spy in FBI history. He may have been responsible for the death of 10 sources in Russia who were working for the U.S. secretly as double agents. So what was it like working for that man? Um, he was one of the most odd, eccentric individuals you'd ever meet, and there have been entire books and movies um, written about him and psychological studies done about him. And I tell the story in the book that in the aftermath of his arrest, when investigations were done by everyone as to who, who knew what, when, and what in the Lord's name happened with Hanson, they set me down because I had worked with him for a brief time. And it dawned on me in that discussion that Hanson had actually given up to the Russians one of my own double agent operations. Um, and that was early or from early in my career and that he had actually handpicked me as a young agent in Atlanta to get promoted to headquarters because either he was guilty about giving up my operation or he thought I was so good against the Russians that he wanted to watch me do it um, or just wanted to keep me close to the vest because of suspicions about what happened to my double agent. So um, that's all in the book. Um, it's one of the worst betrayals. And oddly enough, it's in the chapter called Credibility. And you wow. say, why, why is it in Credibility? Because the FBI screwed up and then hunted down one of their own and announced what they were going to do to fix it. Um, as, as we talked about earlier, this question came in days ago. Um, and this focuses on the Canadian espionage case that you cover in the book the Jeffrey Delisle affair, which was um, the longest, um, the largest espionage case in 40 years in Canada. And um, the viewer wanted to know what changes you thought um, CSIS and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police might um, undergo as a result. Yeah, so so it, it's, a, it's a long involved story. Some of, much of it's in the book, what I'm allowed to tell by FBI pre-publication review standards. But I, I want to say this. Um, first, uh, the Canadian partnership is, a, is astoundingly strong, and I'm incredibly impressed with my friends and my allies in both the RCMP and in CSIS. And um, I've got tons of success stories, and it's all about the personal relationships and dedication of any ally. And, and it's why over the last four years I've been so disturbed by um, by allied relations just seemingly breaking down or not being given the attention they deserve by, by the previous administration. But here's the deal. It's a discussion of systems. 
The FBI, as you know, is a hybrid law enforcement and intelligence agency. It wears both hats. And I think that gives it tremendous strength and value in the speed and flexibility and effectiveness with which it can operate against both a spies and terrorists when you wear both of those hats. Okay, you know that in the UK and in Canada, they have a wall up. There's two different systems, right? You've got in, in the UK, you've got MI5 domestically as an intelligence service. And then you have the police departments and special branches like those at, at the Metropolitan Police at Scotland Yard. When somebody needs to get arrested, similarly in Canada, you have to call a cop, somebody with, with handcuffs, right? You don't have to do that in the FBI. And the problem with the, the Delisle case in Canada was that the US intelligence service had learned that a guy, a Navy officer named Jeffrey Delisle in Canada was hemorrhaging allied information from all of us to the Russians. And he had to be stopped. So when we approached CSIS and told them, you got a Russian spy on your hands that has to be stopped right now, we are hemorrhaging data. They worked it, they confirmed what we told them and then somebody had to tell the cops, the RCMP, to arrest this guy. Well, guess yeah. what? Guess who had to do that? Me. Because <laughs> CSIS couldn't tell them what they discovered in their secret intelligence um, investigation. I had to tell them. I had to write a letter on FBI letterhead. You have a spy. Please arrest him. Sign Frank Figluzzi. And they had to, guess what? They had to start all over again with their own investigation of the same guy from ground zero. And meanwhile, he's still hemorrhaging all of the secret data of all the allies. So that needs to get looked at. That needs to change. Wow. All right. Um, what are your thoughts? We have heavy question um, about racial bias in law enforcement as regards to you know, domestic terrorists who are, you know, perhaps targeting true protesters. Um, the, the person asking the question referenced in particular, say the white proud boys going after um, folks, um, Black Lives Matter protesters. So, you know, do you see racial bias um, in this and how can it be countered? Um, through um, law enforcement across the land? Just a little question. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have. <laughs> let, me, um, let me try to touch on that. Let me see what I can do. Look, I don't think any credible law enforcement professional can any longer say with any credibility, nope, there's no racism in any of our decision-making. We don't have any such issue. After what we saw last summer with riot and, and response in our cities and what we saw at the Capitol. And here's what I mean by that. As a security professional, your decision making, particularly on, on crowd control and event security, is supposed to be threat driven, intelligence based. What is the intel you have about risk and threat to this event? Okay. This summer, we had, we had vast majority peaceful protesters protesting excessive use of force by the police, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. We had, a, we had then embedded in there this so-called ideology of Antifa, people really against the presidential administration, and they were mixed in as well. And then we had a very good dose of street thugs trying to break windows and steal sneakers out of storefronts, okay? Opportunistic criminals. So what was the response to all of this largely peaceful um, motivated protest? riot gear, SWAT teams, National Guard, Department of Homeland Security agents on the streets, and there we have it. Gas, pepper spray, pepper bombs, and rubber bullets. There you go. Let's fast forward to the insurrection on January 6th. What's the intel? The intel is really bad things are going to happen. There's stuff on social media that is talking about breaching barriers, overwhelming the Capitol Police. Um, putting people on trial and making citizens arrest in the Congress. What's the response? Uh, well, we're going to have Capitol Police ring the building in their daily uh, uh, un daily uh, uniform of the day outfits. And boy, we hope those little barriers hold. There's something wrong with this picture. And you'd be remiss to think that racism and skin color um, doesn't have something to do with it. I, 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 you know, you've heard this uh, asked on TV by many people. If the people entering that building that day 
trying to kill the vice president, trying to stop our democracy, were another skin color or another religion. I don't think you would have seen the shooter restraint displayed by those police officers. I don't think you would have seen the insufficient resources. It may never have happened because the building would have been tactically sound and hardened. I, you can't ignore the, the factor of race in, in all of this. Thank you for speaking so candidly, Frank. Um, really appreciate it. We could do another hour, but we can't. But folks can certainly buy your book and look for your commentary on NBC and elsewhere and follow you on Twitter. Um, uh, we will be posting this program on YouTube um, in a bit. So we, we thank you so much. And Andrew, your incredible questions are always terrific. Um, it was a really great conversation. We didn't, get to, we didn't get to a quarter of the questions. And I apologize to our viewers for that. But we thank you for being here. We thank you to our sponsor, AT&T Public Sector. This enables us to have great programs with people like Frank. And, um, and if you enjoyed it and you wanna um, keep me and Andrew employed, you could, uh, you could donate to the Spy Museum's Mission Resilience uh, campaign to, to keep us all going until we can all go outside again and, and be together in good ways. Um, so thank you so much. Frank, Andrew, any, any last words? Um, I think I think for me, just really quickly, Frank, I think I would obviously strongly recommend the book and it's available in our online bookstore. So you can uh, you can get the great insights from Frank's career um, and you can also um, try to make sure that me and Amanda aren't furloughed for too long. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and, and let, from, from me, let me just express my appreciation to Andrew and everyone on the team at the Spy Museum for a great discussion and for having me and to everyone who joined us for taking time out of the middle of your day uh, for what was a great discussion. Please stay safe, everyone.